Hi folks, Astronomy Live here. I've been called out by Terrell Blackstar, who's taken issue with my previous video debunking this hoax asteroid threat. He says that what I did in that video was completely ridiculous, and basically I'm just trying to make myself appear smart. Well, the truth is I did what I did for good reason, but let's see if he's got an easier way to determine whether or not a given asteroid is truly a threat to Earth or not. Extremely predictable. And what I'm seeing here is just a bunch of nonsense. And I, it's difficult for me to uh, fathom that people are running around like this. Let's look at the, whenever you get a, see a story like this, do this for yourself. You want to know the name of the object. You don't care about all the other stuff. Just look at the name of the object and let's go get 2015 TB45. Look at Okay, first of all, you might notice that the asteroid he mentions, 2015 TB145, is not the same asteroid that I mentioned towards the end of my video, uh, which was asteroid Bennu. And that asteroid is the, uh, the asteroid that OSIRIS-REx is actually headed to. It's actually headed towards asteroid Bennu, and that's why I talked about it. Uh, BP Earthwatch mentioned it as well, and uh, that's why I brought it up. Now, 2015 TB145 is mentioned in the original article that started all of this mess back on September 12th. And it does get a mention in the article, but it doesn't appear that the person is claiming that uh, this asteroid is the one that's actually going to hit Earth. It's just mentioned. There isn't an official designation given for the asteroid that's supposedly coming to hit Earth this weekend. It just mentions these missions that uh, were launched over the last few months and claims that they're secretly launched to go intercept this asteroid. So that's why I addressed these launches and we took a look at each of the payloads from each launch prior to OSIRIS-REx and saw that they're still in Earth orbit. OSIRIS-REx is the only one out of these launches that actually left Earth orbit, contrary to the claim made in the article. That's why I attacked it that way because that's the actual meat of the claim, something you can go out right now and verify. Since they don't give an official designation for this asteroid that's supposedly going to hit Earth, and they don't give actual orbital elements, that's why I showed you the, the actual payloads from these launches that preceded OSIRIS-REx to show that the article was false. So let's proceed to the part of the video where he addresses uh, my channel and the video I made about uh, this claim. And this fella here, let me, let me pull this guy up right here. The Astronomy Live, he's talking about uh, using word salad. Holy mackerels, this guy will not shut up with the word salad. You don't need all this about these satellites that are being sent out there. You don't have to debunk something that is so ridiculous and spend so much time. To me, it seems like he's just trying to sound smart. Okay, well, that wasn't the point. The point was to show you guys the payloads, since that's the part of the claim that can currently be falsified, since they're not giving an actual official designation of this asteroid that's supposedly going to hit us, they're not giving orbital elements, they're not giving valid coordinates, that's what we have to work with. So that's why I did it that way. However, let's go over the technique he uses to take a look at uh, 2015 TB145, and see if he's got an easier way of doing things. So you can see he's playing around here with the uh, JPL Java applet orbit diagram. All right. Let's see if I can grab a hold of this thingy right here. See, now you're looking right along the plane right here with the planets. This guy dives way down. So what you're going to do is, is turn this thing around using these little levers here and then zoom in on it. And you want to look, notice where the dark blue line and the light blue line come together. This point right here is where it's going to shift from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. You see how that works? Dark, light, that's where it switches. And that is an extreme important point right there because that's where the Earth is traveling on the plane. And you're looking to see where this guy crosses. The opportunities it's going to have <clears throat> is crossing Earth orbit path on the way in and then on the way out, traditionally, if this is going to be something that's a problem. Usually these types of situations are zero. 
problem. Okay, so let's take a look. Probably need to back out just a little bit more. See what kind of a path this guy takes. And then let's turn it around and see if there's any opportunity. See it's crossing Mercury orbit. Let's, this is Earth orbit path right here. You see it's coming under and over. You see that when as it's coming in, reaching its perihelion position, that it is nowhere near our Earth orbit. So it's whenever it turns around, it's on the inside of, looks like it's just about at Mercury orbit path. Real close to Mercury orbit path right there. Okay, but here's the, you're going to want to, you're going to want to move this guy and see. <laughs> There's just no opportunity. If this thing is going to have an opportunity, like it's going to be over here. But then the Earth has to be, remember the Earth is moving 66,000 miles per hour. Let's just move it forward. And you can watch. You see this guy that's going out? That's what makes this kind of funny. This guy's going this guy's going the other way. And see where it's moving out towards his aphelion position over here? Look at the dates. You're going all the way through to that 2017. You're gonna tell me this thing is a threat? I'm not buying it. So let's stop this instead of going one day to Okay, I'm gonna just stop it there, but you can see how long he takes with that JPL job output trying to extract precise information out of it about a potential encounter between an asteroid and Earth. Now, there's something very wrong with this picture. I don't know if you guys noticed, but there's a disclaimer up at the top of the orbit diagram. Let's go to the JPL website. So, if you read the disclaimer, it's a 3D orbit visualization tool. The applet was implemented using two body methods, meaning or, meaning uh, gravitational perturbations are not being accounted for here. And hence, it should not be used in bold for determining accurate long-term trajectories over several years or decades or planetary encounter circumstances, which is pretty much exactly what he's trying to use it for. Now, in this case, he's looking at the orbit out into the future and at least for the next couple years, there's no particularly close encounter between this asteroid and Earth, but there was a close encounter in uh, October of 2015, and it would not be a wise idea to try to use this Java applet to accurately determine the circumstances of that encounter, because gravitational perturbations will not be accounted for. So that asteroid is being treated as if the only thing that's affecting its orbit is the gravity of the sun. As it gets close to Earth, obviously Earth's gravity becomes important. But this applet will not account for that. It's a very simplistic tool, just meant as a general visualization tool, not to be used to try to extract precise information about planetary encounter circumstances. Now, the minimum orbit intersect distance between this asteroid and Earth is pretty low. And that is why we did have a close encounter back in October. And you can get precise information about close, uh, close approaches of this asteroid from NASA by clicking the pros, Close Approach Data table. And sure enough, if you come down to October 31st, 2015, there it is. There's a close approach between Earth and this asteroid. Now, back on October 31st, as it happens, I did a live webcast of this asteroid. There it is. There's TB145 tracked with my telescope, using software that I personally programmed myself uh, specifically to do this job, to track this asteroid. And I programmed that software to use information that would account for the gravity of Earth. Uh, in fact, the uh, calculations I used to track this asteroid accounted for the gravity of all the major planets, because it is important, particularly the gravity of Earth and the Moon. So let's see what would happen just as an example, if I were to use two body methods, just like the, J, uh, the JPL Java applet, which specifically dis has a disclaimer that says, don't use me for planetary encounter circumstances. Let's find out what would happen if I tried to use two body methods to predict the position of this asteroid during that close approach. If I had done that back on October 31st, 2015, 
and tried to track the asteroid using those assumptions, what would have happened? Well, uh, here's an image from that webcast. Uh, and this image, we can take a look at the FITS header data. This was taken at 4.59 and 27.25 seconds universal time. I uploaded it to astrometry.net and astrometrically solved it. And then pulled up the coordinates for TB145 in the image. Then I calculated the predicted position for the asteroid uh, with perturbations accounted for. Now this is a, uh, the, these coordinates right here correspond to the geocentric position. So this does not account for topocentric parallax. This doesn't account for uh, my exact location on the Earth. This is if I were sitting in the center of the Earth looking out. So there is a small difference between the geocentric coordinates and the topocentric coordinates, the actual detected position of TB145. But it gets pretty close, uh, close enough that it would certainly land in the field of view of the telescope. And you can see right there projected where it would be in the image uh, if I just used geocentric coordinates, but accounted for perturbations. So I did the math on that and did the math for uh, simple two-body methods. And that's what you see here. So here are the orbital elements for TB145 pulled straight from the JPL Java applet site using the orbital elements shown here. So these are the orbital elements that the Java applet is using. And they're at an epoch, which is now at July 31st, 2016. And so if you try to project back all the way to October 2015, October 31st, 2015, when that actual encounter happened, here are the coordinates that it predicts for the asteroid. So if you do the math, that's the predicted position of the asteroid using simple two-body methods, not accounting for the gravity of Earth uh, over time, not accounting for the gravity of the, of the other planets over time as you project backwards to October 31st. If you try to plug that in and predict where the asteroid is, it's actually already being projected here, but you're not seeing it because it lands outside the field of view of the image. You have to go all the way down here. This is where two body methods would have predicted the asteroid to be using the orbital elements that are currently available on the JPL site with the Java applet. So if you use those methods to try to predict where the asteroid is and then track it, if I had done that, Back on October 31st, the asteroid would not have been in the field of view. And I would have been quite disappointed and confused <laughs> because it was actually going to be and was up here. Now, fortunately, I did account for the gravity of the planets on the asteroid. And so my tracking was accurate and the telescope nailed the asteroid right away. It landed in the field of view first try right out of the box. No problem at all. So this is why it is important to use proper methods to calculate the positions of asteroids, particularly during, astro uh, during planetary encounter circumstances. So you can do that a variety of ways. If you want to use NASA's website, the close approach table will give you accurate calculations that account for the gravity of the planets. You can also use the uh, horizons system to generate accurate predictions, which again, will account for the gravity of the planets. But the one thing you do not want to do is you do not want to use this Java applet because it specifically says you shouldn't because it is using two-body methods. They make that disclaimer up front. They even put it in bold, so it's really kind of hard to miss it. Um, so if you want to see a graphical representation of the orbit, you need to use a more advanced program. And there are both uh, free and commercial programs available out there to do that. Uh, one I would recommend particularly for asteroids and planetary encounters would be ORSA. And you can get that for free. I'll include a link in the video description. But generally, and I'm not really just trying to uh, pick on Terrell, but generally a lot of channels on YouTube will just default to this JPL Java applet because Anyone can use it, and it's easy to get to, and you really don't have to know anything about astronomy to use this. Um, so that's what a lot of people default to, even in circumstances where it's not at all appropriate. 
And that's why I wanted to show you guys just how inappropriate it is. If I tried to use these methods to uh, track that asteroid, I would have failed. I just flat out would have failed. Uh, of course, you can't use the Java applet to, to, re to directly control a telescope, and that's another good reason why. But using the same mathematics, using the same methods, you can see what it would have done. It would have flopped. So fortunately, uh, I knew better than to do that. And so when I do these things, when I use these more advanced programs, like FindOrb, for example, I used that in my previous video, it also accounts for the gravity of the planets. It's not graphical, it's not pretty to look at, but it's very, very, very functional. Um, and so there's a reason I do that. It's not just to show off or make myself appear smart. There are justified, very important reasons uh, to use more advanced tools when trying to analyze these situations. So thanks for watching, folks. Clear skies.